My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hi, thank you for tuning in to the podcast today. My name is David Summerfleck. I'm your host. My guest today is Mickey Kennedy. Hi, Mickey. How are you doing? Good. Glad to be here. Thank you. I appreciate you taking some time to talk with us today. Uh, Mickey really created e-releases about 22 years ago to give small businesses access to the media and to a national newswire all with a personal touch. E-releases help small businesses, startups, authors, and I'm sure NPOs as well, uh, get website traffic and better quality customers through coverage in the media. Uh, E-releases writes and distributes press releases to journalists, trade publications, and key industry influencers, increasing visibility and credibility while bringing you more revenue for your dream ideal clients. Mickey Lee lives in uh, Baltimore with his family and two cats. Uh, Mickey enjoys British science fiction and acknowledges an unhealthy addiction to diet soda. Mickey holds an MFA in creative writing uh, with an emphasis in poetry from George Mason University. Mickey, is that all correct? And uh, yep. how are we doing so far today? I'm good. Great. Let's start with introductions if I can. Uh, I know you started the company 22 years ago, as we said, and you have an MFA in English. Um, what was it like 22 years ago when you started e-releases? Was it the same company? Uh, did you start as a solopreneur or did you have a skeleton uh, staff and a handful of contracts? How did that start? It started, I was working for a, uh, a telecom startup and I was wearing a lot of hats and one of them was uh, sending out the press release and we were doing it through broadcast faxing in house. So I was having to program the machine. I think it held a hundred numbers yeah. and then we'd hit send. It would take all day to send the next day. I would delete those numbers and put another 80 or 90 in because we needed to reach 190 people. It was just, I lost two days whenever I did that. And uh, we started to get a lot of journalists calling us and saying, hey, could you just email that to us? There's a lot of numbers and statistics. We'd rather just copy and paste it. And that's when the light bulb went off and said, you know, emailing press releases is so much more efficient. Um, and I wonder if I could start a business around that. So I talked to my boss and he thought it was a good idea. And in the evenings uh, and spare time, I would just uh, reach out to journalists and ask if I could put them in my database and send them relevant press releases. Um, I, it took about a year to do that. And when I launched, I had about uh, 10,000 journalists in my database and uh, just would uh, send an email press release uh, to these journalists. And that's what I did. Over time, PR Newswire reached out to us and said, hey, you should also include our uh, Newswire distribution to your customers. And I said, there's no way my customers can afford that. It starts at $1,000 for yeah. a uh, national press release. And so we went back and forth. Uh, they looked at my customers. They're not people their salespeople are ever going to reach out to because they're doing two to four releases max a year. And they're just not going to invest the resources to try and reach the small business owners uh, and, and other people that just, you know, make up my customer base. And we, we saw that uh, they had an overnight staff um, so they could work on our press releases overnight, no additional labor charges for them. And so we created a, a solution that worked, um, you know, was a win-win for both of us. And so every release that we send out at e-releases is a custom national distribution over PR Newswire. Um, and you get, you know, 99% of what you get uh, when you send the release uh, nationally through them at a much higher price point. 
Now, let me ask you, uh, and for, uh, do, you, do you coordinate with uh, other similar types of uh, associations or organizations such as the Society for Professional Journalists. I used to be a member of them, SPJ. There's um, there's another one I think called IRE.org, -E Investigative Reporters and Editors, I believe. And I, I know you're aware of Help a Reporter Out. Right. Do you coordinate yeah. with these organizations? I am a member of the National Society of, of Public Relations Professionals, NSPR. I, I, wait, uh, I, I forget the actual acronym, but uh, I'm, I'm a member of that. Um, I um, I feel that it, it I, where I get some overviews of what's happening in the industry, but I feel like it's very specific to mostly PR firms and things like that, which uh, a lot of them aren't dealing with the type of customers I'm dealing with. So uh, mine's a little more specialized uh, in, in focus, but um, I, I, I do feel like it's useful. Um, you know, I, I, I see a lot of trends that have happened over the years, um, over the past 20 years, um, I guess about 12 to 15 years ago, blogging became real popular and the newswire would not accept bloggers uh, as journalists. And uh, I they, can understand that. Yeah. So that was very difficult, but over time they came to recognize that there are bloggers and individuals who have more traffic and more influence than some trade publications. And so they started to open it up and uh, they've almost done a, a 180 where now they're embracing all different types of influencers. Um, there are, uh, you know, an Instagram professional signs up to receive fashion releases. They'll look and say, wow, this person's got like 240,000 followers. Sure, she can take as many releases as she wants because yeah. she's she's definitely someone who, uh, you know, is, is, is influential and has a lot of connections based on, you know, uh, the assumption based off of how many followers that she has. So uh, the industry was slow to catch on to digital, I think, but they've definitely embraced it and they're moving much more forward to uh, being accepting of digital. Um, the landscape <laughs> is, is changing. Uh, as we all know, you know, the future of print is in question, but, you know, a lot of newspapers and other people are migrating online and they're trying to figure out how it all works. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, we find people are getting a lot more opportunities uh, rather than less opportunities because of how fractured it's becoming and how uh, many ways you have to reach people of influence that are not just maybe the regular newspapers, the regular magazines and, and trade publications. I can definitely see that. Let's, um, for those who are not familiar, can you basically define what a press release is and how they work? Right. So a press release is basically just an announcement. Um, it, it's usually written in third person. Um, if you do a search for what is a press release and pull it up, you're, you're going to be like, wow, this is you know pretty uh, easy and simplistic because it's meant to be very simple. It just gives you the who, what, when, where, how, occasionally why of what you're announcing. And you're just trying to get that information across. Um, if there is anything that's really, you know, captivating or beautifully written it's usually within a quote because you want that quote to be used and you want it to be meaningful so it usually has a higher standard of writing and elevation than the rest of the work um, but they are pretty simplistic um, they you know usually you'll see for immediate release on it there's a dateline with a city and state um, and then the media contact uh, with a, usually a person's name uh, email address and phone number is always recommended and i think the newswire requires it because um, the last thing a journalist wants is they write an article the managing editor reaches out to him 30 minutes before deadline and says, Hey, I need a clarification of what this person meant uh, here. And all of a sudden, you know, they're sending you an email and you've left for the day. So having a phone number is really uh, saves a lot of stories at the last minute because it is surprisingly or not surprisingly perhaps that uh, so many things get picked up right close to deadline where they're just reviewing a second time and they're like, Oh, this may not make a lot of sense. And, and, you know, Maybe you to get a clarification. I, I had that happen to me many times where I was the reporter uh, in that situation. Let me ask you as an aside. Uh, I remember when I worked in a couple of newsrooms, we the fax machine would be going basically 24-7. And 
in a lot of cases, we would have stacks of papers and you would go through them very quickly. And how do you make a, a press release stand out when you're dealing with reams of paper like that? <clears throat> Well, most of it's digital now. And yeah. um, so like the Newswire, for example, um, will send the feeds directly to newsrooms, their intranets or whatever. But a lot of journalists will just uh, create an account and log in through their website. And what they do is they uh, pick the type of feeds they want. So there's a feed for banking. There's a feed for technology. There's, there's lots of different feeds. And then you can customize it. You can say, I want every time these words or phrases appear or I want to exclude these phrases. So you can make it a very customized um, feed that is including stuff that should be relevant for you. Um, that being said, you, you want the headline to be uh, the, you know, the most captivating that you can make it while also being factual. You don't want puns or to be playful. That's the stuff that journalists do for readers and actual consumers. But for them, they just want the facts and they want to know what the message is and what the announcement is. They're viewing um, these feeds by headlines. And then if they like a headline and they want to learn more, they click through and they'll see the, the rest of the release there. And so uh, you, you really want to spend a lot of effort on the headline. And also for the same reason, the opening paragraph is extremely important. You want to really, um, you know, anchor the release, what it's about and, you know, put your best foot forward. Help listeners and viewers, if you can understand why press releases provide the biggest ROI, return on investment of uh, the majority of different types of marketing campaigns if they do. And there's a part two to that. So if you want me to wait, I'll wait. Sure. So um, the, the thing about a, uh, a PR campaign is uh, they work so effectively out of leverage. Um, I always say if you're going to do a, a PR campaign, you want to do six to nine releases is usually a PR campaign and you want to try to fish with different bait. So you're trying different hooks and different angles and trying to figure out what works for your industry. There are uh, some strategies that you can use um, and, and try to, you know, make it as strong as possible. Um, but the, the ultimate goal is uh, when you're, when you're doing this is trying to uh, determine what is, you know, what is something that I can craft that would be of interest to an audience? Because the journalist is acting as a gatekeeper and anything that you can do to make, uh, you know, content that they would want to share with their readers or viewers uh, is, is going to give you a, a, a much better chance of, of getting, um, you know, media pickup. Um, there is, uh, you know, when you, when you do a, a, a PR campaign uh, that, that leverage can happen. We did a release last year for a company uh, during the pandemic. Um, it was very positive press release. And at the time there's a lot of negative news. So that helped it. Um, they ended up getting over $10 million in revenue from it. It was a new initiative to help local restaurants, help your local restaurant nationwide. Um, and uh, you know, it, 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 it got wall street journal, Washington Post, you know, all the major publications and a lot of minor publications as well, including a lot of food trade publications and blogs. Um, we stopped counting at 150 major outlets uh, just because it, it had done so, uh, so well. And, you know, I, 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 I dare you to find a Google ad where you spent $400 and got $10 million as a return. I, it, it just doesn't happen. But with PR and press releases, Sometimes that is possible. Now that is an outlier, um, but it's not unusual for people to spend, you know, um, a, a few thousand dollars uh, on a PR campaign, you know, like $2,500 for four to six releases and end up getting, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in revenue as a result of it. Plus they now have links uh, from several websites coming to their website, improving their SEO and those uh, customers are probably going to continue to come through through searches. When people do searches and find an old article, as long as the article is still up, they're still going to click through to you. So it has a longevity um, that can be, you know, much longer than just what a paid click would be. And, you know, for those reasons, you know, mm. you, you really can't beat the, the potential ROI of, 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 of PR. The thing that people have to understand is just like you wouldn't measure an ad campaign based on say a hundred impressions 
or two clicks. You don't want to measure a press release based on just one press release. And, uh, so many people try it. They do one press release uh, because it's all the only thing they could think about announcing and nothing happens and they feel PR just won't work for them. And I, I would challenge people to look a little more strategically and say, is there something that is more compelling and newsworthy you can come up with? Uh, one of the things that uh, go to for some of my customers is put together a survey or study and uh, issue that. And uh, the media generally, mm-hmm. if you have a hundred or more respondents, will pay attention to it. And, uh, you know, I had an auto repair a company in Pennsylvania uh, that was looking to get links because they had a new website. Uh, long story short, but they had had a brochure site that the Yellow Pages had put up for them, and that was their only website. And then when they went away, so did their website. So they had a new website, and they weren't coming up for rankings. And they said a really smart SEO guy said, uh, "If you get um, auto trade publications linking to you, mm-hmm. uh, you can you can rank really quickly because it's really relevant and shows that uh, your what industry." you're in. Absolutely. And so we did it. Um, I, I, uh, they didn't know who to send the survey to. Uh, I was like other auto repair centers. They said, we don't know any. And I said, well, do you belong to a small trade association? And they said, we belong to a big one and a small one. I said, forget the big one, go to the small one and ask if they'll share your survey with other auto repair centers. And, uh, they said, why not the big one? I said, ah, the big ones are hard to work with. They don't really you know, need the attention, but the small ones don't get a lot of love. So if you say, I would love to mention you in a survey and have it go to your members and you would get billing, I would get billing, we'll send the release out. Um, They they love that. And so they got uh, several hundred responses um, and uh, they ended up getting picked up in about 14 auto trade publications, really large ones. And so, you know, all their problems went away. They started ranking. Everything was worked out really well. They also ended up getting picked up in their local newspaper, which they hadn't really intended because they had a different goal. But, you know, people started coming in and saying, hey, I saw this uh, study that you did. Uh, In that study, I always recommend that you put a couple of weird questions in the study. Uh, Often, uh, those are the ones that are clickbaity or people find most interesting. And the one that they included was an open field where it just said, what's the strangest thing anyone's ever left in a car being repaired? And it was just, uh, you know, people wrote wrote in stuff and we picked the top 50 strange things, but they were like a a, a boa constrictor was left in the car, uh, grandma in an urn. And they didn't know about it until someone called and said, we have to go in the car and get grandma out. And they're like, what? And then they see him bring an urn out. And so there was lots of little stories like, but that was the things that a lot of these places resonated with. And a lot of the stories were built on that. Um, People would pick the, you know, top 10, top 20, they would, you know, share those. And that's what the local newspaper did as well. And it's a, it's an easy way where if you feel you're not very newsworthy, and this is just a small auto repair center in Pennsylvania, they're not the um, leaders in the auto industry by any means, but they were able to get in front of a study and a sur- and by doing their own survey and make their own news. And that's something that anybody can do regardless of what industry you're in uh, or anything. And so, uh, you know, the, the barrier for entry is really low. Um, but when you, put together a survey and you get some numbers, it, it's it's a really s- strong way to lead with data, which journalists seem to love. And, you know, all you need is a survey monkey account or even a free Google form account to be able to start collecting the stuff and just have a link that you share, uh, whether it's with your own customers, your leads, or if you partner with a trade association. I think that's a great example of basically cross-pollinating your marketing approach where you can integrate the digital with the more traditional uh, types of marketing. When we talk about digital marketing and press releases and more traditional marketing, is there a sort of best approach that you recommend where you have the digital marketing, the PPC, you know, the pay-per-click, digital advertising, the press releases. Is there an approach that you recommend so that the business owners who are struggling can get the most ROI from their effort? You know, in other words, should they have the website with the researched SEO first or the branding, the website, the content, or does it matter? 
Um, we work with people of all different types just because I don't like to turn away money. So we no, take people who, who, have, uh, who are much better prepared than others. Uh, some people that don't even have a website, um, but they're an author and they're on Amazon and stuff like that. And I always recommend that it really doesn't cost you anything to go uh, quickly create a Facebook page and at least have a destination there that you can also send to people, but you would control it. You would be able to put the content on it and, uh, and, and hopefully capture some people who like the page uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and so I do push people to, to sort of uh, stretch themselves a little bit because at the end of the day, if you have a website, you can control what happens on that page. You can collect email addresses. Um, you can, you know, you have the cookies so that you can retarget them and things like that. But so many times, if you just send to a third party website like Amazon or something like that, you, you really lose that ability to do that. Absolutely. And so uh, I do, I do encourage that. I also think that for, you know, metrics, I always try to figure out what someone's looking for. Um, you know, I always assume people are just looking for more customers. Uh, but in the case of the auto repair shop, uh, once we started talking, we realized that they weren't really looking for their own customer base. They were just looking for auto industry uh, trade publications, which have a high authority to link to them. And so, you know, knowing that goal sort of uh, allows you to adapt what the approach you want to have and what you want to announce. Um, you know, for, for a local company like the low, uh, auto repair place, if they only wanted local coverage, you would have to try to, um, you know, focus on something that's a little more targeted and specific, whether it's a, a fundraiser that you're, you know, working with the community, or, you know, maybe it's a local survey that you did with your community that community papers would want to share and get out and things like that. Um, so, you, you know, you're, you're, it's all about having a conversation and figuring out what the, the, the goals are. Uh, if it is, uh, you know, just looking for more customers, I always say, uh, you know, try to uh, measure it against what your existing revenue and clicks are. Uh, if you know that you get so much traffic in this particular month, I wouldn't go and start another paid ad campaign at the same time because you want to be able to kind of measure and get a feel for, oh, we saw a 15% bump over the last, uh, you know, 90 days following that press release. Um, you know, uh, you know, can we attribute it to that? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there's no like tracking link that you can include that's going to, you know, say, oh, yeah, that was definitely the press release or the articles that resulted from the press release that did that. So you, you really want to just sort of know your numbers so that if you do see a bump, you can potentially attribute it to that and, and get a feel for, for what happened. Um, other things that I always recommend is, you know, when people order, how did you hear about us? And sometimes uh, even with a good clipping service, you'll find out that you got media coverage in places that you didn't even realize. Um, uh, we had someone who got picked up in the years ago, the parade supplement that comes with all the newspapers and stuff like that. And they didn't that. even know about it until people had just mentioned it in passing. And then they circled back to me and, and we just thought it was really interesting, but uh, um, they did see an uptick in traffic and they just couldn't attribute it to it because it was a, uh, a paper publication. So there's no link in your log showing the traffic coming from one particular site or a resource. Let me ask you about budgets because that's always the um, the situation for service providers, especially. It's always that case of the the two gunslingers. One is, you know, what's your budget, and the other one is saying, you know, what's what's how much for your services. Is there a way to for a business owner to budget in advance? or know what to expect or, or uh, estimate a range before engaging in a press release campaign, if that makes sense. Sure, so our pricing is on average 200 to $500 per press release. Um, and there's some new customer specials that can get that a little bit cheaper. So if you're looking at say $400 a release um, and you're writing it, uh, let's say you're not, uh, let's, uh, that'll make it like say five fifty, six hundred dollars $600 release for about $2,400, you know, you can do four releases. Um, and so I always say generally for about 3000, you can do five or six releases is, is, is a good rule of thumb. Um, 
And if you pay for the writing initially, most people quit paying for the writing because they realize this isn't, you know, rocket science. It's very simplistically written. Maybe you feel comfortable having uh, someone write the first release for you, but it's something that you should be able to do. Um, I, I always say, you know, can you allocate $300 a month uh, over a year towards PR? If so, you should be able to do, you know, six releases throughout the year. So every other month, um, you know, just taking that into account. Um, and you really want to do several releases and learn from each one. Uh, you want to see, you know, did this move the needle? If not, then you try a different approach, um, a different strategy. Um, the this, this survey and study, I find it works every time. I don't know if someone who's done a survey or study under my advisement uh, and, and not gotten some media pickup. So that's, you know, make sure you want to do that as one of your strategies. Um, you know, another strategy is being contrarian. If everybody in your industry is saying one thing, what can you say intelligently and reasonably mm. that would go against that? And, you know, every issue has a pro and a con just list the cons and just internalize the the cons on that argument and get out there and, um, you know, uh, express your opinion, have a couple of compelling quotes and a press release about it. Uh, what you'll find is uh, when the industry is writing about a topic a lot, uh, there's so many people that are just going with the grain that if you send out a release, you, you, you wouldn't get picked up. It's very unlikely that your quote will get picked up, but because, journalists are supposedly objective. They want to cover both sides. If no one else is saying the opposite and you're the only person, every article is potentially a place where you could be there as the counter argument. Mm. And so you stand much more likely getting um, picked up when you, when you are in the contrarian viewpoint. So that's an easy one to do. Um, just don't be stupid about it. I had a customer who, who said some outlandish stuff and then he says, Oh my cust I had to take the press release down. Cause he said all his customers were complaining to him. And I said, you know, you really have to be comfortable with what you're saying. Uh, and you know, you don't want to be contrarian for the sake of being contrarian and you don't want to say anything that's going to make your customers look at you as uh, though you're strange or, you know, a, a, a you know, the weird uncle that no one wants to sit to at Thanksgiving or something like that. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's an approach. There's so many different ways to, 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 to build a campaign. And if you try several of these ang angles and you've done five or six and you haven't learned anything through the process, then maybe PR and press releases just aren't going to work for you. Um, that being said, I would say, Hey, did you try the survey and study one? I haven't seen that fail yet. Um, I, I've seen uh, one that only got two media pickups, but it was a state newspaper and a trade publication and the customer felt like it was a win. Uh, that's, that's, and that one, I felt like they didn't put their creative head on and have a couple of those oddball left field questions, because if you have those, I feel like it's a good arsenal to, to build a press release around, uh, you know, everybody's going to be interested in the, the numbers and statistics that you have, but if you have a question that was a little out of left field, you stand a much higher chance of, of creating some clickbaity opportunities that the media just loves. And, you know, I say clickbaity uh, because, you, you know, it, it is one of those things that drives clicks and people see it. You see these types of articles and stuff like that. I'm not saying that you're disingenuous, but you're focused on something that's more fun and entertainment rather than necessarily factual. In the case of the auto repair place, there wasn't a, a real survey of how many people left, you know, boa constrictors in the car. It was one place that had one boa constrictor left in it, uh, you know, one grandma in a urn. So it's not really statistically relevant, but it was strange and unusual. And by collecting them in one place, it made for an interesting read and people were excited to, to read about these strange things. Let me ask you about where branding and knowing your unique selling proposition or USP, where those intersect. How can knowing and refining these two. And to me, branding is a part of knowing your unique selling proposition. So how can knowing this and kind of refining it make a business owner or entrepreneur more attractive to the media? And I guess that goes to authenticity too. 
Right. So I always tell people, what is it that you do that's unique? What's your USP? And a lot of them are like, yeah, what are you talking about? And I'm like, your unique selling proposition. Everyone's doing something different. Why are you selling this product as opposed to someone else? And then some people will just say, well, I never thought of that. There's really nothing yeah. different from this product to several other the others that are out there. The, you know, the, the only difference that I could then say is, well, your brand uh, because your company is named X and and that's you. But I would challenge you to go and try to find something that you want to own, whether it's getting this product out there the fastest, you know, like really quick shipping, uh, you know, is it that you bundle it with something, find something that makes you a little bit different than everybody else, because that's easy to market because there's all kinds of segments of audience out there. And some are going to respond to an offer that's a little bit different than others. And if you're just selling a commodity, it's really difficult to market that and be successful doing that. Some, you know, some people do in local markets where, you know, it, it just works. Uh, if you're the only person producing corn or something in a field and, you know, uh, you can only sell it to one, one local place without spending so much in transportation, you're limited. But Absolutely. for people that are online and selling products and services, you really have to have something that uh, makes you a little bit different. And sometimes it's the culture. Um, you can be, have a whimsical fun culture, uh, you know, and, and you can make that come across as much as possible on the website, uh, your 404, you know, page not found, all these different opportunities to express your culture and stuff like that. And that can be, you know, part of your brand, part of your unique selling proposition. Um, if, and generally, if you have a USP, it potentially could be a newsworthy angle because so many times what you're, you're doing that's unique is uh, something that could get through a gatekeeper, a journalist. Not always. Um, you know, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you bundle your, your software with something else may not really move the needle very much, but if there is something that you're doing, uh, like, you know, uh, if you're selling sandals, and uh, for every pair that someone buys, there's a free one that goes to uh, someone in a third world country. You know, th things like that, it rises to the top of potential newsworthiness. Um, uh, and so you just sort of want to do an audit, an inventory of what it is that you're doing that's unique, what stands out. Um, you know, about a third of the people that appear on Shark Tank use e-releases to uh, market themselves uh, before their episode airs. And they always That's get media idea. coverage. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, the producers of the show mention us, but we can't say they endorse us or anything like that. But uh, uh, it, it is it is really cool uh, because we see all these people um, on, on the show and we recognize mm -hmm. them as customers. And they do get media pickup. It, 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 it's twofold. One of it is they're going on a national TV show, Shark Tank, people like it. Uh, but there's also the flip side that they're usually small businesses, they're startups, they're undiscovered. And journalists like to have uh, be viewed as as curators and to find little obscure gems and share them with their uh, audience. So I find that startups do really well, even those that don't appear on Shark Tank, because startups generally know what they're doing that's a little bit different than everybody else. They've really honed in what their USP is and what distinguishes them from everyone else. And because they're small, uh, they're they're usually thinking more creatively and doing a lot of creative stuff that lends themselves to being discovered as a you know, as a little gem that a journalist would want to share with their readers. The large companies journalists don't want to give them free space. They want them to pay for ad space. So you know they don't love writing about a new version of of Microsoft Office or something like that. But if you have something uh, that's really unique for you as a small business, they feel like hey. Uh, they can't afford to advertise in our newspaper uh, most of the time. These small businesses don't. So let's, you know, put them in front of our readers. I know that my readers would find this really captivating and interesting. It's a fun product. We can do a, a Father's Day roundup of fun products and, and have some uh, quirky, interesting little things here and there. So um, uh, it, it is easy for small businesses that are have a, a strong USP and or a strong brand to to get some uh, uh, traction uh, in the media and to get some media coverage. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, focusing and testing it. And if that doesn't work, 
try something slightly different and see if that might. Okay. Well, you kind of answered my next question already with that. Um, let me ask you, what are some tips for writing a, a winning press release? I know you said that they're pretty simple to write. Are they always in the inverted pyramid or should they always be in the inverted pyramid style that a lot of us learned in journalism class? Right. And I'm set, the part two of that that I wanted to ask you was what assets should a professional PR writer bring to the table? So I guess the question is, what makes up the the best winning press release? And then under what circumstances should the business owner say, we really should hire a professional? Right. So I think the inverted pyramid is still the standard. I would advise everyone to stick to. There's always going to be exceptions, um, but uh, I I don't think it's you. So if you're you're thinking I'm going to do, I'm going to carve my own way and and go against the grain, I wouldn't advise it, especially as an early adopter. Uh, the people that sort of break the rules are probably the ones that know press releases the best and have written so many on the inverted pyramid that they're comfortable enough to test something different. Um, uh, you know, I always say that, you know, opening headline, opening paragraph is the most important. Um, uh, uh, I, I say a clear call to action. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so many people say, well, this isn't an ad, an ad or a landing page. But if your goal is to get people to go to your website to buy, then just say, hey, for more information, you know, including uh, a, a free downloadable guide, uh, visit here. And uh, if it's a white paper that you're uh, wanting to promote, you know, just mention the the value that they would get out of it and send them to to that page. There's nothing wrong with having a call to action. And so many people say, I don't see a lot of them in press releases. So I assumed I couldn't have one. And there's no reason that you can't. Um, you, you, you know, you don't want to make it like. Uh, but you, if you do have an ultimate goal where you want people to either sign up for a newsletter or to get on, get a white paper in exchange for an email, uh, then, then, you know, say we have this valuable resource that includes X, Y, and Z, and you can download it for free at, and then just include that. Um, other things that are really important is, um, the media. Uh, so like a photo, um, a, you know, a company logo is always smart. Um, so many places are migrating online. So they love having the additional, um, uh, search engine opportunities that additional media has. And so, uh, you know, putting a photo next to an article, it's another way for people to find out about the article and to uh, be visually stimulating to readers who go to the website. Um, another thing that's worked really well for some of my customers is infographic. And, uh, you know, a, a really strong infographic can get uh, a lot of traction and a lot of attention there. So um, mm -hmm. that's something else to consider as, as, as potential collateral to include with your release when you send it. Well, that's that's actually something completely new. I'd never heard of that before. I always thought that uh, it would be difficult for formatting purposes or... Or well, they don't look so well on the newswire, uh, the infographics. But that being said, um, they do make them downloadable and they've done really well for some of our, our um, customers who've had just really a great, you know, uh, a great image, uh, an mm. infographic. It's like in Pinterest, if someone has an exceptional pin, uh, it's going to get a lot of attraction. And so sometimes uh, an infographic is one of those things that uh, my customers have done. They put it up on their blog. They saw that it, it did really well. And they said, I wonder what would happen if we put it in a press release and, uh, um, you know, uh, made the press release about the infographic. And sure enough, it got a whole new second wind and a lot of places uh, published it and linked to it and, and included it. So that's, that's another, you know, opportunity, um, you, you know, not just writing, but the, what you uh, actually send out is images and things like that are important. I would say, you know, of, of the three things, a photo, an infographic or a logo, the least important probably is the logo. But, you know, that being said, it is part of your brand and it's it's, it's easy for people to incorporate into an article, um, you know, and let them decide what they want to include. When press releases don't garner the returns that the business owner wanted, what, are, are there usually 
you know, uh, I don't want to use the autopsy metaphor, but I mean, are there, are there usually reasons that you yes. can point to uh, as to why? Are they targeting the wrong uh, audience, perhaps? It's rarely targeting the wrong audience. It's usually just pro providing the wrong press release. Um, strategically, what they send out was not very strong. Um, you know, if, if you look back and you did four or five releases and one of them was about a new hire, uh, one of them was about uh, your website being uh, mobile responsive and, uh, you know, things like that. I just say none of that moves the needle. No one cares. And they're like, well, but we spent $150,000 making the website mobile responsive. And I said, that's great. Hopefully it will improve conversions. Your customers will have a better experience. But nobody in the media is really going to find that of interest. Um, and the same thing with a new hire outside of maybe a trade publication in your local newspaper. Very few people want to cover a new hire unless it's someone who's like really exceptional in your industry. Um, you know, it's like industry renowned. Then, you know, that that would be the exception. But so many releases we get they look like they came from, uh, you know, they were created out of committee. They're very safe. Nobody took a chance. And the announcement is just, you know, not that interesting. And, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, if you take the same story and, you know, try a different draft and put like a crazy captivating quote in there, you would stand a much better chance because sometimes I've seen where a quote is so exceptional that the story's ho-hum, but the journalist is like, I want to write an article just so I can include that quote in it. Uh, you know, that quote is exceptional. And quotes are often done as an afterthought and they're safe and static and they don't do anything. And that's the one place where if you succeed in getting that quote in an article, because they have to say who said it and you know, who, where you're from. And so uh, I, I've seen lots of people who probably wouldn't have survived being in an article because they're too small or unknown, but they got the pickup because they had an incredible quote. And I always say, when you build a quote, make it something that cannot be easily paraphrased. If they were to just paraphrase it, there would be a loss. Mm. And that's sometimes where you get to art and my creative writing background, where you really want something that's just beautifully said and you know, succinctly said, and just really a powerful statement. And if you can incorporate that into a quote, you can take a mediocre press release and make it much more likely that it would get some uh, traction. I only have about one or two more questions for you. I wanted to get your take on what do you, where do you see the future of press releases heading in the next five to 10 years? I just wanted to get your take on that. I think we're moving to video. And, uh, you know, I, I personally am not the biggest fan of video. Uh, I've only gotten more comfortable, you know, being on camera uh, in, in recent couple of years, but I do see that as a progression because if you're wanting to make content consumable to your audience, the, if you look at the audiences, they're moving to video. Um, you know, a lot of news is moving to video segments. Um, Facebook has said that within the next two to three years, they expect the news feeds to be a hundred percent video. I can uh, see that. Yeah. So I think that that's got to be a migration that we take into account. I don't know whether that changes the job of the press release. I mean, are you going to be writing a press release that then will be turned into a video or will the writing of the release be uh, a video mm. source and use sort of like, you know, the footage and stuff like that. I don't know that that, Yet. It could go in a lot of different directions, but I do think the progression is to video. And I think that uh, it would be short-sighted to ignore that. I think that, that that's probably where a lot of places are, are you know, and people are going. Maybe, maybe it'll be similar to podcasting where you have the audio podcast, but then we also have the video version. So if people just want to see what you look like or, you know, read your expressions or what have you, um, some people just consume media in, in different ways, you know, uh, but I'm with you. I'm un wildly uncomfortable in front of video. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. You just feel like, well, if I don't look like Brad Pitt, I really don't want to be on video. 
but you you roll with it. But I I could definitely see those changes coming. Um, the only other question I have for you, Mickey, is basically how could people be, best uh, get in touch to learn about press releases and e-releases? Because I think you've done a very good job of representing okay. what you, what services you provide in the company value. Thank you. So um, the website is ereleases.com. Um, I do have a free masterclass that I created for my customers to try and get them to do more strategic press releases. Um, it's less than an hour long. And anybody that looks at that will immediately have eight press releases that they could do for, for them and their company, or if they're an author or something like that. And they're strategic. So they're much more likely to succeed. And that's at ereleases.com slash plan, P-L-A-N. And uh, uh, I have my social media on the website. Uh, LinkedIn's a great way to reach me. Uh, I do occasionally uh, uh, check up and catch up on all my emails there. Um, but uh, we're on all the socials and uh, I welcome people to come to the website, start a chat with one of the editors um, or give us a phone call. We have no salespeople. It's all editors at e-releases and uh, there's no commissions or quotas. So if they talk to you and don't feel you're a good fit, they're pretty blunt and they'll just tell you that. Um, and there are some people for whom uh, PR doesn't work because of limitations with the newswire, um, certain stuff with alternative medicine and, and health and things like that. So um, it, it's, it's free to talk with us and we can give you an assessment of what we think would be the best route to go forward with the PR campaign. Okay. Well, listen, I really appreciate your time uh, talking with us and, and helping listeners and viewers learn more about press releases and, and your services as well. And for anyone tuning in, uh, whether it's by video or audio, I'd like to t take a minute to thank you for tuning in and um, keep in touch. And please stick around for another minute or two, Mickey, and that'll uh, tie up this episode. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.